This is Speaking of Events, the podcast for event industry leaders. We bring together innovators, strategic rock stars, and visionary creatives to talk all about events, industry trends, and anything in between. And speaking of events, here is your host, Carrie Garbus. A long time ago, I got called to do a gig by my favorite corporate event company at the time. And the job was to dress up like a 1940s reporter and there would be other actors playing 1940s reporters. And we were all going to be like a fake paparazzi greeting the event guests. Um, I now have no recollection actually what the event was, but I remember it was like big and fancy and a lot of people. And I am like all in on this assignment. I am psyched. And my friend Bobby Creighton is also there with me along with a gaggle of other actors. And so I just, and Bobby and I are like, we decided we're going to be a pair and I'm going to be the reporter. So I had like a little notebook and a nubby pencil and he's going to be the photographer. And if for anybody who knows Bobby Creighton or you can look him up, He's like quintessential 1940s guy. He's so good at this kind of stuff. So we decided we are like the it, the new, the newspaper it duo of the night for this, this gig. And so people are coming in the door, uh, celebrities, regular fancy people walking in and we're like, over here, hey, look at us. What's your plan for the night, right? We're, we're trying to get them to take fake pictures and ask them questions and it was really fun because there were some really cool celebrities who came in and we could see who would sort of uh, ignore us and think maybe we're real paparazzi, which we clearly were not, or the other actors who were very much willing to play with us. And, and that was super fun as well. So there we are. And all of a sudden, Annette Benning like breezes into the party and uh, Bobby and I are doing our thing. And she was with a younger guy. And I don't, I don't know who the younger guy was, but he kind of hung back. So she, she continues to breeze in and he turns around and, and turns to Bobby and I, and he said, if anyone comes in or over to you looking for Annette, please do not tell her them that she's here. And we're like, okay, Frico, like whatever it, yes, we got you. It's fine. We, we really thought nothing of it until about 20 minutes later, this big scruffy guy, totally looking like he does not belong at this event, like saddles up, up to the paparazzi and he asks if indeed is Annette Benning inside at this event. So Bobby and I take it upon ourselves to be the 1940s bouncers to this guy. And so we start harassing him in character, by the way, all the way back to the street street. And I'm like, sir, what's your favorite color? Where are you going to dinner tonight? Like not answering any questions about Nanette Benning. And Bobby's getting all in his face with the cat, the fake camera and the big, the big light. And indeed, we scared him off. And that is the night, my friends, that we saved Annette Benning from her stalker. I share this with you because that event was produced by none other than my guest today. Did you ever know that story? I, I never knew that story. But when you started talking about you and Bobby being paparazzi, yeah. I, I had a bit of a flashback because yeah. that was a popular thing that we were doing yes. back then was like brilliant improv actors coming and interviewing Come guests in and making- and, and save lives. We were saving lives. Mayhem and protecting the beloved- Annette Benning. An Annette Benning, exactly. No, I have no idea what that event was. Anyway, here to talk about that event and so much more is someone I consider a friend, a director. You've directed me many times, a mentor, and oh, and a love, if I may say that. I am so pleased to invite to the speaking of events stage Jeff Kalpak from First a global brand experience agency. Welcome to the podcast, Jeff. Thank you. Oh, but thanks for that intro. You got me a little choked up there. Oh, really? I don't think yeah. I've ever been introduced as a love before. It's, well, it, I, I'm going to guess that a lot of people would introduce you as a love if you gave them the opportunity. No, I you. speak to a lot of people who know you and it certainly starts off with, oh, you know, Jeff, don't you love him? 
Oh, and that's thanks. a love. It's You're nice very welcome. You. You're good. very welcome. How about a first very hard hitting question to kick us off? Yeah. Okay. All right. Go for it. Jeff Kalpak. What is the one thing you wished more people knew about events? So uh, for me, I think it is the incredible shelf life that they have, that we have these experiences, whether they are private events, social events, corporate events, et cetera. And when they're done well, they stay with you a long time. And I love that to think that we create something that happens once, but can live on in, in the way that it makes us feel. I love it. Is that right? Is I was going to say, I was going to ask, is that the emotional connection? That is the emotional connection. And sometimes what's said at that event. I mean, it, listen, it's harder sometimes to remember exactly what's said, but more certainly we remember how we feel. Um, and I think back to some magical moments as maybe corny as it may sound that I've experienced in in a hotel ballroom or in this space where someone has done something really profound, really memorable, and it has stayed with me. And then of course, the social events, the, the ones that we attend that blow us away when we revisit them, looking at photos or just conjuring up the memory of what that event was. So I think that's cool to be in an industry that is creating things that last beyond the one time that they happen. Is that, is that how you start the event process? You sit down and think about the, the feeling to start with the product? Does it, what does it start with? I think, I think for me, it's always started with the message. What, you know, what are we, what are we going to say? What are we asking people maybe to do? What do we want people to feel? And to start from the end. So we call it our principles of storytelling, and we have about 10 of them. And, the, and really the first one is think about where you want to end up, what you want to leave that audience with, and then build backwards from there, regardless of the format that you're using, whether it's digital, hybrid, in-person. What's, what's the event when I say shelf life, and really you said it, I'm repeating what you said, when you think uh, event with a massive shelf life, whether that was something from first, whether that was something from somewhere else, what, what comes to mind in terms of a great event with fantastic hardcore shelf life? Okay, so, so this is going back much earlier in my career. And I heard the founder and CEO of a biopharma company get up and speak to a group of about 80 people on an incentive program. And what he had to say about their contributions to the organization and his predictions for the future of where they were going to try to take medicine has stuck with me to this day because he's such a charismatic individual. And, and a bit of a profit in, in that industry. Wow. And to see him be able to get that crowd in the palm of his hands and get them all excited about what the future held for them, I thought that was pretty powerful. Yeah. That's a corporate event. Right? It got me. It got me right in the gut. And I, I loved it. Corporate events can be emotional experiences. Yeah. and because they are their story their stories it may not be a story on stage some of it could be on stage some of it's within the interaction the aesthetics all of it yes absolutely so you know as you know i'm a little bit into speaker coaching you know that I do. <laughs> you do. You knew that about, about me. So Jeff knew me as an actor first, at no pun intended. And, <laughs> and then it was after I had, you had directed me in a show and I worked for your previous company, BKA, as well as, I don't think I ever worked as first as an actor, but you're with BKA. And then once I started Ovation, we started 
working together with some yeah, speaker coaching. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's an obsession of mine. So what, uh, any speaker stories, you know, disaster, hot mess shares you could give up? So I, I'd like to think that we've saved people from some hot mess potential by talking them, often it's talking them off the ledge and preparing them in a way that they never thought that they needed to do in order to not be a hot mess. Right. Um, so I've had the speakers who have said, you know, when this starts, I will bolt off the stage, never to be seen again. I can't do it. I've had the speakers who've been like, I don't know, you know, I, I don't really know what I'm going to do with my hands. So just like, please tie them up for me. And, <laughs> and, you know, speakers who've, who hyperventilated, wanted to cry, people who, you know, disappeared or go vomit in the bathroom. But I think, I think it's less about the disaster and more about the solve that we can provide for people. And then again, the big win that happens when they deliver and then they go, well, right. I, I really could do that. It's not as terrifying or it's terrifying, but I can still do it. And I'm good with that too. So what's the, what's the number one solve? What's the thing you wish more speakers did? Other than hire ovation as their speaker coaches, yeah, obviously. Number two. I, I think that people don't always realize the amount of preparation that it takes to make it happen. Great. And that preparation can look many different ways. It can be how you have to work on yourself and the actual delivery. It can be on how you have to prepare from a content standpoint how to prepare for all the technical challenges that may be facing you when you need to interact either in, in this virtual way or on stage. So I think it's that underestimating the amount of time that it will take. And I also think, and Carrie, you probably hear this a lot, you know, I don't like to rehearse because, you know, when I rehearse, you know, it's not going to be, okay. Yeah. Like, no, that's just really not true. It's not true. Right. I'll sound like a robot. I won't. It gets boring for me. I, I yeah, I, I hear, I heard some of it earlier today. I hear it all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So things, things have changed in the event world. Well, in the world, also the yes. event world. Yeah. And we, a lot of the, the digital, the hybrid, et cetera. So what do you, what's not what has not gone out of style? What's not going to go out of style? What is sticking around? As much as things have changed, what is sticking around? Yeah, I think I think what is sticking around is this concept of storytelling. I really do. Whatever, however we're going to deliver it, we still at the core of any event have to have a compelling story to tell. That's to me never going to go out of style because that's what allows us to connect with each other. And that so that's foundational for me. And what do you, can we do, can we do it in the hybrid environment? Yeah, I think we can. Absolutely. We can. We tell stories, it, you know, think about all, all the different ways that you are absorbing content during the course of a day, whether it is on listening to a podcast, yes, going to a watch party, go, you know, right. there's, it's all possible. It's just the skills to deliver it are different. So we need different kinds of people than we did years ago, but this is an industry that's been evolving. I mean, I've been in the industry a long time, so it's been called different things over the years. Um, and it, there's been a, a very clear evolution of the kinds of skills that have been needed to deliver the experiences that people want to have as audiences evolve. Right. What was it called? You mean like going from, I think, because back in the actor days, I think we would call it corporate entertainment, a we corporate would. entertainment company, right? It was a corporate entertainment company. You you did industrials, oh, industrials um, for a right. while. Yes. Did a lot you know, of again, very early on, you know, flashing back 30 some odd years, like, we were business theater. So we were, we were those things. Then for a while, you, you know, we were like communications 
you know, specialists, which to a degree, maybe we were, then it became event, you know, events of marketing, event marketing, this, and now it really is. And I think it is the most accurate. We're creating experiences. The experiences. Yeah, for sure. Brand stories to individual people who need to hear them, want to hear them and, and want to interact with those brands. Yeah. And it, so as many as names as it has been in the past, it's, a stressful industry. Yes. Uh, with, and especially, yes, over the past two years. Before that, it was also very stressful seeing you in action, seeing you juggle a gazillion things. See, I have a very distinct memory of you uh, very early on when Ovation started to work with your company that you said to me, so you may get an email from me at very odd hours and I don't expect an immediate response. And sure enough, I did. Also, I send emails at very odd hours and I love when, I mean, there are times, Jeff, I've sent you an email at like 3.50 in the morning and sure enough, five minutes later, you're like, oh, I'm up too. Let me, <laughs> so I appreciate that. There is a lot of stress. So how do we, how are we caring for the people now? I mean, it's, it's a, it's, I think a, a critical time for caring for self-care and for caring for others, especially in this industry. I couldn't agree with you more. It's a, it's so top of mind for me on a daily basis is, you know, is everybody okay? Is everybody okay yeah. right now? What else can we do to help you be okay? Uh, I think leading with empathy is the key. Um, I can't help you if I don't know what's going on. Uh, it helps us create better events when we really step into the shoes of our audience, our clients, you know, our stakeholders in the event to really understand where they're coming from, what they're doing, what the landscape is. That's a big, it's a big deal. Yeah. If it was, yeah. if it's stressful before now you're doing it, you're doing it, you may be, you know, juggling your child or looking after, you know, someone who's unwell Yeah. or, 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 or the million permutations that, that exist in everybody's big, beautiful, complicated lives. What is that? What has this done to your leadership style, do you think? You know, I, I like to think that it was a quality for me that I always had was to take the time to talk to people and make sure that I knew where they were coming from. But now I think it requires a little bit more digging sometimes to make sure that the people really are okay, to make them extraordinarily comfortable, to be flexible, extremely flexible with people right now. Give them the opportunities that they still want, but sometimes in a time frame that may look a little bit different than the one that you had in mind. So it, it, it's different. I also think I've had to tap into just the experience of, of being around a long time to reassure people that we will get through whatever it is, only because I know that I've gotten through like a lot of other stuff <laughs> over the years. Yeah. And to give people hope, um, to keep things positive and encouraging for people while still keeping them real. I think those are all things that have come up over the last couple of years in in refining the way that I, I want to show up as, as a leader. Is this the thing that is gonna get people not only to stay in our organizations as we're going through this great resignation and also to attract people, that empathy, front and center, empathy, empathetic leadership, is, is that the thing? I think it's a big thing. I think what's so interesting right now is it is such an individualized approach for people. 
and who wants what from an organization. So I think for people to truly be engaged, you kind of have to be firing on all cylinders. So it is, is the leadership empathetic? Do, do the you know people that I'm going to work with, will they take the time to look after me? What is the onboarding process going to be like? Will there be opportunities for advancement? What's, what's the L&D function like in this organization? And then of course, how am I being paid? What's the flexibility around time off? You know, what do the benefits look like? Is it fun? Is the environment where I want to be? You know, how are they? Uh, how's that organization look from a diversity and equity and inclusion standpoint? Are they taking real steps? How does that company look from a sustainability standpoint? So I think there's a lot of different things that matter to people. And it's important to pay attention to all of them. Because if you really want to foster a broad, diverse, creative environment, you have to be able to satisfy many different kinds of people. Yes, especially that next generation, yes. the people that will be sitting in your seat. Yes. one day. So how are you doing that? I know this is a big piece of your, your, what you're passionate about in your current job. Yeah. So what, how are you cultivating that, that next round of leaders? Yeah. You know, we, we have a formal leadership program in place in our company, which is great. There's more and more attention being paid to uh, people that want to advance in the organization and how to help them do that. And for me on a personal level, I just like to make myself available to anybody who wants to have a conversation about how did you get here? What do you think I should be doing? What do you see in me? You know, what's, what's missing? And have those open conversations and be willing to take the time with people. I think that's critical. Yeah to really encourage people because, you know, I mean, Carrie, if you think back, you know, in your career and your path and what you did and what you've achieved and, you know, you, you're a working actress, like you were doing your thing and wanted to do more. Mm -hmm. And it's not like you, you know, knew how to, how to run an organization. Like you, you yeah. learned how to do it yeah. from people who encouraged you and, believed in you. Yeah. Yes. So we got have a lot of good safe. mentors. Got a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, for anybody who's willing, uh, you know, then I'm willing to give the time. So how did you end up here? Right. Mm. You and I went to the same college at slightly different times, just yes, a little, a little we different. Did. Yes, we did. Syracuse University. Yeah. So you're, you grew up upstate New York? I grew, up West, in, I grew up in Yonkers, Western? New York. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Grew up in Yonkers. You know, yeah. when we when you live in Manhattan, we call that upstate. Everything's so yeah. Upstate. I, everything's upstate. So you're in you you're in Yonkers, you go to Syracuse. And then and then what happens, Jeff? Yeah. So I so I, I got my degree in public relations and psychology, but I also had been working, you know, not working, but in my mind working, at, you know, I was a performer from age yeah. five and, uh, you know, community theater and all that. And I was determined that I would have a stellar acting career despite my degrees. So my degrees were to satisfy my parents and what my passion was, was to come to New York and be a big Broadway star. And that didn't happen, but I did work quite a bit as an actor um, TV commercials, tours, blah, 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 and then moved into directing and loved, loved being a director and didn't like the a month out of New York living somewhere, you know, going here for yeah. this period of time. And I kind of fell upon special events. Um, as a bit of a survival job in between acting gigs. And then I met Lynette Barkley and we, for, because we really didn't know any better, thought that we could do events. Um, you know, we started the company with $5. So that was our, that was our Amazing. investment. 
in the organization. And we started doing what we knew, which was entertain audiences. And then that turned into a broader bit by bit by bit. We just, you know, kept adding services, et cetera. God, I made that really long. Edit that down. I really, <laughs> it was really good. It was, like, like, it was your journey. I could have just said it was a fluke. And I met Lynette Barkley and we took a big risk and we jumped in and we did it. But it was the theater. Yeah. It was all the things that I loved about the theater without the things that I didn't love about the theater. Right. I talk to many event professionals who come from a theater background because mm -hmm. that's what it is. It's theater in action. Absolutely. Yes. And now it's television in action. Well, yes, it's television in yeah, are you now, now you're, are, now there's television directing, right? In, yeah. Simultaneously with other stuff. You, you guys are dealing with, a, there's a lot of headsets. How many, there's, how many headsets are happening? There's a lot. There's a lot. So it's, it's kind of remarkable when you think about an industry that transformed during a short amount of time under extreme amount of pressure for people who are already under an extreme amount of pressure to suddenly go from you know, being live event producers and creators and all of that to suddenly learning a whole new vocabulary, a way yeah. of doing things and then making it in a short amount of time, quite extraordinary in the delivery. So I think the industry as a whole needs to be applauded for that. Um, it really is, I, I think it's, it's quite impressive. Yes, absolutely. You are wonderfully impressive. Thank you for sharing all of that with us. How do you feel, Jeff Galpak, if we jump into our lightning express round? Okay, fine. I have no idea what's coming my way. I, know, I guess I that's know. the point. That is the, that's the whole point. So yeah. it's 45 seconds on the clock and I'm going to ask you probably eight questions and you're going to answer them as fast as possible. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Jeff Kalbach, what is your favorite moment in the event process? My favorite moment in the event process is the brainstorming session. Ooh, who do you consider your mentor? My father. Yeah. What was your favorite place to hang out at when you were at Syracuse? <laughs> Rags. Was that Bragg's? Bragg's? Yes, Bragg's was totally there when I was there. I never went, but you know, I was a really good girl. Okay. Brownie um, Alamo and a beer. Yes. M Street. Yes. Okay. Uh, what, oh, what do you do every day to stay healthy and sane? I do many things. I have a motivation music list. I meditate in the morning. I dance around my house no matter what. I play tennis when I can. Um, Oh God, the list goes on and on and on. Oh, nice, nice. Who is your favorite tennis player? Rafa. Well, Serena and Rafa. I thought I'd give you Rafa first. Okay. But Serena. Okay, that's right. Insane for Serena. If you were not talking to me right now, what would you be doing? If I wasn't talking to you right now, I would be making something to eat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and what would that be? That's not okay. Uh, what was the name of the show that you directed me in um, in early 2002? Broadway Celebrates America, and you were who could forget? <laughs> Broadway Celebrates America, 52 <laughs> cities in 13 weeks, or something ridiculous like yeah, it that. It was insane. That was totally insane. And when one bus driver wanted to kill me, last question. What is the best way to take care of an event professional? Mm. Let them download to you about how hard their day was and also back off when they don't want to relive it. Oh, that is, that is some good advice. Thank you. Guess what? You've survived our lightning express round. Congratulations. Also, there's no clock. Don't worry about it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> here's what i wanted to ask and i thought it might be too emotional so if it is we can cut it let me know i also wanted to put on um are you gonna get another dog oh you're so sweet for asking i don't know that we are and, and you know it's funny i don't have a photo of him here 
Uh, yeah, I'm surprised. What, what was that like when I turned my head and I, did you get a bad reflection? No, no, I did not. It looks fabulous. <laughs> okay. Um, he's, uh, oh, you know what? He's on a needle point there and he's in a big poster in the other room. You know, I mean, Carrie, you, he had a really successful career, our little guy. I know. And 17 and a half years of him. And he was discovered on the streets of New York. He had two agents. He had the career I wanted to have. <laughs> um, I don't know if we're going to do it. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a commitment. I know. It's tricky. I know. Comes up in conversation, though, often. Okay. All right. Yeah. Keep, keep me updated on the dog front, please. I I please. Will. Jeff Kalvac, where can people find you if they would like to connect with you? <laughs> Jeff.calpac at firstagency.com. You gave her, you're the old, the first guest who's ever given their email. That's amazing. Oh, Thank it's you. fine. I mean, I'll either right. respond or I won't. Like if you're spamming right. me, no, but if but you have something, you know, and listen, we're, we're recruiting like crazy. So <gasps> if you're Ooh. talented and amazing, don't necessarily send it to me, but you could, you know, you can always ask me anything, but go online and check out our jobs. We are growing. I mean, we're so thankful and appreciative that we're growing fast and growing well. Um, so that's, that's my right. plug. I love it. We, you know, I, I have believed this from the beginning of time that you surround yourself with really talented people and the rest of it will, it will things will take care of themselves. And so I wanna surround myself with more talented people. Yes. And for someone who has worked with for Jeff, absolutely. You've created a welcoming, warm, smart space there. And I highly recommend it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being my guest on Speaking of Events. And by the way, if you're only listening and you're not watching, which is totally fine, uh, there is a big poster of like a big monitor speaking of events behind me. So anytime I say it, I stop and I gesture and I realize that, that people have no idea what I'm doing if they're just listening. So thank you listeners for dealing with the awkward pauses. And thank you, thank you, Jeff, for joining me. Thank you. And you're very welcome to my audience. Thanks for listening. If you like events, if you love events, even if you loathe events, Tell someone about this podcast and hey, you can review it. And as always, whatever you speak about, remember to be speaking of events. Speaking of events is sponsored by Ovation, the gold standard for professional presence and speaker development training, helping everyone get prepared, get confident, and get Ovation.